Okay, so here we are. Uh, this is lesson number seven in our, uh, in our study of the life of Jesus in chronological, uh, chronological order. Uh, last week we finished the events recorded during Jesus' second year of, um, of uh, ministry. And uh, during this time we see that He is immensely popular uh, but we see he's making enemies. You know, the, the beauty of, of studying Jesus' life in chronological order is um, the ability to see the, um, uh, the progress of his ministry and the effect of his ministry, not only on his apostles, but the effect of his ministry on the people and also the, the pushback that was coming from those who were hearing his words, watching his actions, seeing the miracles, we get to see um, the progress of that reaction that people have. So um, uh, he was becoming immensely popular, that is true, uh, but he was also making enemies at the same time. The Pharisees and the religious leaders uh, wanted to kill him, um, and even some of the disciples uh, are leaving uh, because of the demands of his, of his teaching. Now, most of his teaching and signs have been performed in the northern part of the country, with occasional visits to Jerusalem. So his main work so far is in the north, and then during the times of the festivals and so on and so forth, he goes to Jerusalem uh, to teach and to, uh, uh, to be known uh, uh, among the people there. Now the apostles have now been uh, chosen uh, by this time, and they're ministering on their own, as well in the northern area, around their own uh, villages, around the people that they know. And uh, as uh, Jesus enters the third year of his ministry, still in the north, but uh, he's going to begin making more appearances in and around Jerusalem to declare his person and the purpose of his ministry as well. So we start the next section of events describing his ministry from the third Passover to the beginning of the last Passover week. So that's where we are. In the, you know, in the overarching um, uh, uh, movement of his ministry. Uh, and for those of you who are taking notes, for those of you who are keeping tracks with notes, we are now in the third Passover to final week and we're beginning uh, event number 68, which is the healings um, in the Gennesaret area. And that uh, the, uh, the passages that deal with the healings in the Gennesaret area are Matthew 14, 34 to 36, and Mark chapter six, verses 55 and 56. Now, our last event, or in our last event, Jesus was in the synagogue at Capernaum, if you remember the last lessons that we had. And Gennesaret was south of the city of Capernaum. Mark says that many were healed simply by touching the fringe of his cloak, the fringe of his cloak. And sometimes we're thinking the fringe, does that mean that his cloak was frayed or torn and they were, you know, there was some fringe there. Actually, like other male Jews faithful to the law, Jesus had a blue tassel at each corner of His garment. And this is what they were reaching for uh, in faith. This, uh, this was not a special thing that only Jesus wore. All you know, faithful Jewish men wore this uh, on, their, uh, on their garments. And so this is what they were reaching to, to touch. Uh, event number 69, the Pharisees begin to question and they question uh, the hand washing rituals uh, that Jesus actually wasn't doing. Uh, Mark, uh, Matthew chapter 15 verses 1 to 20 and Mark chapter 7 verses 1 to, uh, to 23. Now Jesus' successful ministry in Gennesaret was interrupted by the Pharisees who had come from Jerusalem to observe and to confront Him um, not, not to find out anything about himself or not to find anything out about his ministry or his teachings or anything like that. They, they wanted to confront him in order to discredit him with the people. And one of their accusations was that uh, his disciples violated the, what's called the tradition of the elders. Uh, and they violated that tradition, among other things, by not observing the ritualistic washing of their hands before they eat. Today, we, you know, we wash our hands uh, mainly for hygienic purposes, don't we? We wash our hands for germs and dirt and so on and so forth. Well, aside from that, they didn't have, hy hygiene was not the idea, it was a ritual at that time that the Pharisees had. Uh, the tradition of the elders 
was a body of rules and, and, and regulations created by the scribes that dictated how the law was to be applied. So when the Pharisees were talking about the tradition of the elders, that's the, 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 those are the writings that they're talking about. They're not talking about the actual law. For example, the law said, the actual law of God said, no work on the Sabbath, that was the law. Um, uh, but there were over a hundred definitions of what work was and what leisure was and so on and so forth. That's what constituted the tradition of the elders. And so Jesus replied that these things were no more than man-made rules that had, had no authority from God and thus no authority over man. You know, how many times and in what way you were to wash your hands before eating. Uh, these things were rules invented by men. They had, had no authority uh, from God. And so Jesus goes on to show that it isn't dirty hands or even food that defiles a person's soul, it's what comes out of his heart that defiles a human soul. Uh, basically, not what goes into the mouth, but what comes out of the mouth that defies the soul of man. So of course, this infuriated the Pharisees because he not only discredited their source of authority, this is the tradition. You know, if they would have said, we say, we think, but that's not what they were saying. They're saying, well, the tradition over here says this, the tradition of the elders. So by saying what he said, Jesus was discrediting the thing that the Pharisees were relying on for their authority. And they, uh, they held it uh, very dearly. And of course, this infuriated them because it not only discredited their source of authority, but also waved away food restrictions to which the Jews held so dearly. And Jesus, by saying, you know, food can't defile you in any way, uh, took away yet another type of hold that the Pharisees had over the people uh, by using food laws and so on and so forth. Now, why wave away food restrictions? Well, restricting, restricting of types of food was a way of distinguishing the people as separate from other nations. So why would Jesus wave those away? Why would He say those are no longer you know, in force? Well, the reason for that is that now, for the followers of Jesus, their faith in Him would be the thing that would distinguish them from other nations. Not how they washed their hands, not the type of food that they ate. This was not going to be the thing that distinguished them from other nations. From here on in, the followers of Jesus, their faith in Him, that would be the primary thing that would distinguish them from others. All right, event uh, number 70. Jesus heads further north. Uh, Matthew 15, 21 to 28. Mark 7, 24 to 30. So this break with Jewish tradition was sure to cause even more hatred among the Jewish religious leaders. So what does Jesus do? Well, He heads further north into Gentile territory. Now, here He meets a Syrophoenician woman who is a Gentile and who asks him to heal her daughter because uh, you know, all the work that he's doing in Galilee, in the northern part of the country, well, the news of this work, the news of his ministry, the news of the, of the, of the miracles and the healings you know, spread out uh, east and west and north. So he goes further north and even in the Gentile area, people have heard of him and this woman, this Gentile woman comes to him asking him to heal his daughter. So Jesus, using the expressions of that day, tells her that He has come to feed the children and not their pets. You know, when in, in this terminology uh, you know, where Jesus said, we're, we're here to give food to the children and not the dogs, it sounds awfully harsh, but in the vernacular of that day, it was not that harsh. Uh, the idea is that um, many Jews at, in those days uh, uh, thought uh, concerning the Gentiles that were, that were friendly with them, that they were their pets. You know, not in a degrading way, but in the sense that they were you know, like a third cousins, something like that. And they had that reference to them. So the woman recognizes the, uh, the analogy that Jesus is using. You know, we're, we're, I've come to feed the children, not the pets. And so the woman recognizes that an analogy and without diminishing the role and the privilege of the Jews, she says that even the pets get a little bit of the leftovers when the children eat. 
And she would gladly accept that. What a marvelous, marvelous answer. And so in this woman, Jesus finds not only a woman of faith, but a woman of humility. And it's so interesting that the stories here, you know, one after another, one is juxtapositioned next to the Pharisees. How do the Pharisees react to Jesus? I mean, they actually see miracles. And, and their response to the miracles is not awe or humility, but rather anger and, 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 and a desire to get rid of Jesus. This woman, she didn't see any miracles. She had heard, she believed, she comes in humility and she asks in faith. What a, what a difference. And again, this seeing it in chronological order, you, you kind of see how these, uh, these events are laid out in such a way that they contrast each other. So as I said, in this woman, Jesus finds not only a woman of faith, but a woman of humility and a woman of perseverance and, and courage. And he rewards all of, this, uh, uh, all of these qualities in her by healing her child without even seeing her. Okay, so we go on to the next event, uh, which would be Jesus' ministry in uh, what's called Decapolis. Um, uh, Matthew 15, 29 to 38, and Mark 7, 31, all the way to chapter eight, verse nine. Now Decapolis, uh, is, in the, uh, is on the eastern side of the Sea of Galilee, still in the north. And uh, this is where Jesus healed the demoniac and sent him to spread the news of his cure among the region. We had said that, uh, remember when um, Jesus healed the uh, demoniac, uh, after he was healed, uh, he wanted to go with Jesus. He wanted to get into the boat and, and, and go with Jesus. And the Lord refused that request and told him to go back to his towns, to his people, and tell them the good things that Jesus had, uh, had done for him. And so he went back to the region of Decapolis, Dica 10. Uh, the idea was that there were 10 cities in that region that were close together. So in this event here, Jesus returns to this area and heals a man who is deaf uh, and there's a great multitude that's assembled to hear him and to see him and to, and to, to receive his, uh, his preaching and uh, teaching. And you wonder, where did that all, all, this is not Jerusalem, this is the north, this is even you know, far north. Well, where did they get all this information? Well, uh, the, the people that come to see him are a result of that the demoniac who was healed. He went back, he told the stories, he preached, not the gospel, but he gave his witness of what Jesus had done for him. And so as a result, now that Jesus comes back a second time into the region, there are many people that are waiting to see him and to receive healing from him. You know, that's a, what a powerful thing um, our witness is. Uh, some people say, you know, I, well, I, I don't know the Bible very well and I'm not good at teaching, that's not my skill. Uh, but I've always said to people, but every one of us who've become Christians, each one of us has a witness. When did I become a Christian? Even if it's something as, as simple as I was a young boy and I was at camp and I heard the gospel and I obeyed the gospel at camp, that story is a good witness to others about how you came to Christ. Some people have perhaps more uh, colorful stories. You know, they, uh, they were into drugs and they had all kinds of trouble and whatever. You know, uh, they went to prison, they were, truly lived a worldly life and uh, heard the gospel and, and, and were transformed by it. Well, that's a more colorful, more powerful witness uh, but a witness nevertheless. And I always tell people, if you don't know what to say, just share what Jesus has done for you. And that's exactly what the demoniac did. And all these people that came to Jesus was a result of, of uh, his uh, good work. So Jesus not only teaches them, but he also performs the miracle of the multiplication of bread and fish for this group. A miracle that he has done now for the second time. All right, event number 72. Jesus confronted again, again by the Pharisees. Matthew 15, 39 to 16, 4 and Mark 8, 10 to 12. So once again, Jesus finishes in the area of the Decapolis and he crosses the Sea of Galilee to arrive at the other side. You know, the Sea of Galilee is like a highway. You know, the, the, the little villages are kind of dotted around the lake and they just crisscross the lake in order to get to one side or the other. So they cross over once again and they get to the other side, and once they get to the other side, the Pharisees are ready, yet with another attack, this time 
to challenge him by asking him uh, for a sign from heaven. Uh, notice a lot of times the people were asking Jesus for a, a sign uh, from heaven. And, uh, and some, you know, some people sometimes question that idea. They say, well, you know, he's doing miracles all the time. What do you mean they wanted to see a sign? Uh, the healing of the demoniac and the, the deaf and dumb person, you know, aren't those signs? Well, their point was that his miracles were not spectacular enough. Oh sure, you healed this guy and you healed that guy, but we want to see something really spectacular. We wanted a sign. They suggested that they wanted a miracle like in the Old Testament, where the sun stood still, or fire and brimstone you know, were called down from the sky, or manna would fall from the sky, food from the sky. They wanted that kind of a, that kind of a sign. And Jesus rebukes them for their blindness in that they can tell you know, what the weather is from the color of the sky, but they can't even interpret all of the signs that He's already given them to prove his legitimacy. You, know, you can tell what the weather is like, but you can't even tell who I am with all the signs that I've given you. And so he refuses to give them such a sign. And he refers them back to the word in the story of Jonah and tells them that this will be the definitive sign from God. And he says this several times, I'm only giving you the sign of Jonah. So what's the sign of Jonah? Well, the sign of Jonah is that Jonah spent three days in the whale and he survived. And so the idea is that Jesus will spend three days in the tomb, or in the earth if you wish, and then be resurrected alive. Uh, Jonah's uh, experience is a type for the death and the burial and the resurrection. You know, he's thrown into the sea, into the wild sea, he's swallowed by a fish, that'd be enough to kill anybody, and then three days later he, you know, he lands on the shore. And so that's an Old Testament type of the death and the burial and the resurrection of Christ in three days. And so basically what he's saying is that the resurrection will be the sign for everyone, including them, that He is the Messiah sent from God. Because we know that other prophets uh, you know, healed people and even raised people from the dead. And so you know, the, the argument could be made, well, maybe he's a prophet too. But no prophet was ever killed and then resurrected. Some went straight to heaven, we never saw them again. But no prophet ever was killed and then buried for three days and then resurrected from the dead. And Jesus saying, this is going to be the definitive sign about who I am. And so this, naturally, these, these things, the Pharisees are talking to people, they're accusing Him, they're, they're debating Him in public. And so this brings about a discussion with the apostles in the boat, and that's event number 73, Matthew 16, verse 52, uh, excuse me, 16, verses 5 to 12, and Mark 8, 13 to 21. So as I said, the, the apostles had been traveling with Jesus through all of these events. You know, they've seen this go, you know, they've seen the miracles, they've seen the healings, they've, they've witnessed the debates that Jesus has with the Pharisees, they've seen the confrontations with the Jewish leaders, the miracles, the feeding of the 4,000. So now they're once again crossing the Sea of Galilee. It's amazing, I, I didn't count actually how many scenes there are of Jesus in the boat you know, back and forth across the Sea of Galilee. But anyways, they're once again crossing the Sea of Galilee and Jesus tries to warn them concerning the Pharisees and their hypocrisy. And the apostles will also have to deal with these people in their ministry. He's warning them ahead of time. Look at the way that they're talking to me. Look at the way that they're confronting me. Well, you need to be ready because that's how it's going to happen to you with them as well. So Jesus uses a figure of speech that they don't quite understand. He says, he talks about the leaven of the, the Pharisees, you know, leaven that you put in bread there, the leaven of the Pharisees. In other words, their false ideas introduced as doctrine from God had taken such a hold that the people had accepted this as the law. So the apostles think that he's scolding them because they forgot to bring the leftover bread from the feeding of the, the thousand there. But after a while they, they understand what he, what he says. And so this episode shows a lot of things, but it does reinforce the idea of how unsophisticated the apostles were and how hard-hearted they were. And one other thing, that you know, they were no match for the Pharisees. 
I mean, Jesus, you, know, you listen to how Jesus debates the Pharisees and He just he answers them and He gives them things that they just can't answer. But here, you know, in comparison to the apostles, the apostles you know, were thick-headed and they were slow-minded. They, they were no match for the Pharisees. And Jesus is trying to prepare them. We don't, quite under, you know, we don't always see the idea that Jesus was going to turn over the mission of the gospel to these 12 people and they were so woefully unprepared at this time. And this, this episode kind of highlights that idea. All right, number 74, Jesus heals a blind man. Mark chapter eight, only one time uh, is mentioned, this episode, verse 22 to 26. So they're in the boat and they're talking about this. Now they arrive on the other side of the lake and the people bring him a blind man to cure and Jesus does so and this is interesting, he does so in stages. You know, he puts first saliva on the man's eyes and then he lays his hands on them and so on and so forth. And some people are saying, well, does that mean he couldn't heal them? Well, it wasn't the lack of power that Jesus had. Probably it was to help the man's faith develop in stages as well. First the saliva to know that Jesus was actually doing something for him and then complete healing once he realized that it was Jesus who was giving him his his sight. Uh, okay, number 75, Peter's confession, Matthew 16, 13 to 20, Mark 8, 27 to 30, and Luke chapter 9, verses 18 to, uh, 18 to 21. Um, Jesus had been challenged by the Pharisees and He debated them. He was still training and preparing His apostles to carry on His ministry. After all that had happened, he tested to see if they remained convinced of his identity, because let's face it, the Pharisees had some good arguments coming from a Jewish perspective. Without this certainty, they would not be able to withstand what was to come in Jerusalem in the not too distant future. So Jesus tests them. He asks them directly their assessment of him. And Peter answers for the group in confessing Jesus as the Christ, the Messiah sent from God. Remember, the Pharisees are denying this thing and, and debating with Jesus about this point. And so you know, once they're alone, Jesus now asks, well, what do you think? And they come back and they, they give him that, that response. And so Jesus asks them directly their assessment of him and Peter answers for the group, because they all answered, but Peter is the one who voiced it. Uh, they confess Jesus as the Christ, as the Messiah sent from God. So uh, maybe they were not good debaters, maybe they were slow of heart and so on and so forth, but on the key issue of the identity of Jesus, this they were beginning to grasp and beginning to be ready to confess. The same thing with us, you know, I don't know if, how well we could do against world-class debaters and you know, people who know a lot about other types of religion, uh, but uh, if we cling to the basic idea, the, the base idea that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, the rest of it can be built on that, on that foundation. So now Jesus wants them to be assured of this, but He's not prepared for them to confess this yet, not, not confess to Him, but to confess to other people. Uh, this will come after His death and, um, and resurrection. You, you notice the apostles didn't go around saying, Jesus is the Messiah, Jesus is the Son of God. That wasn't their preaching before Pentecost. It was, the kingdom of heaven is at hand, uh, repent. That, that was the sermon that they were preaching up until this time. But Jesus is getting them ready for the time that they will make that confession. All right, event 76, Jesus foretells His death and resurrection. Matthew 16, 21 to 28, Mark 8, 31 uh, to chapter 9, verse 1, and Luke 9, 22 to 27. So now that they have expressed their belief in His true identity, Jesus can now further teach them on the purpose of His ministry. And the purpose of His ministry is to die and resurrect according to the word. It's all in stages. Who do you think that I am? Okay, we believe you're the Messiah. Okay, here's the work that the Messiah has to do. Now, this is the first time he tells them this, and they're in shock. So much so that Peter, once again, tries to talk Jesus out of doing this. Um, and what is Peter trying to do? Well, he's trying to protect his vision of what the Messiah should or shouldn't do, and guarding his own place as an apostle. I mean, 
what good is, is it to be an apostle of a dead Messiah? You know, he wants his Messiah to be alive, not dead. And so we know the story, Jesus rebukes him sharply for his very human and selfish motives. It won't be the last time he'll be rebuked. Uh, uh, poor Peter has a, has a hard time. All right, so now three events uh, in, six, in quick succession. I'll just give you the events and then we'll, we'll talk about them a little bit. Number 77 is the transfiguration. Uh, Matthew 17, uh, 1 to 13, Mark 9, 2 to 13, and Luke 9, 28 to 36. The transfiguration, number 77. Number 78, casting out a demon that the apostles could not cast out. Uh, Matthew 17, 14 to 21, Mark 9, 14 to 29, and Luke 9, 37 to 43. And then the third one, the third event in this cluster here, Jesus foretells His death and resurrection a second time. That would be event number 79, Matthew 17, 22 and 3, Mark 9, 30 and 32, Luke 9, 44 and 45. So between the first and second times that Jesus foretells of His impending death, there are tremendous miracles and signs that take place, still in the northern region, but further north and further west. So they're still in the north. So he's asked them, who do you think I am? He, they tell him, we think you're the Messiah. Then he tells them what the Messiah is going to do. He's going to die, he's going to resurrect. Uh, Peter says, oh no, this can't happen. He rebukes Peter and then great things happen after that. After the first prophecy of his death, he takes Peter and James and John up on a mountain and he's transfigured in his glorious state. Luke says that he discusses his coming death with Moses and Elijah who appear. Again, Peter responds foolishly by wanting to make, some, some of your Bibles say tabernacles or booths or tents. You know, so Peter wants to build like a shrine, if you wish, uh, so that they can stay on the mountain in the, you know, we'll build a booth or a tabernacle or a shrine or something, so we'll all stay here. And God speaks saying, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased, listen to him. Well, the point here is that Moses, you know, the appearance of Moses represents the law and the appearance of Elijah represents the prophets. So now God wants the people to listen to Jesus. He fulfills the law and He fulfills the prophets. He supersedes them. We're not listening to the law and the prophets, they are being fulfilled by Jesus Christ. And that's the whole meaning of this appearance, of course, to the apostles and for our sakes as well. And then when they return to join the other apostles, uh, they find that the other apostles are embroiled in an argument with the scribes on a healing that they were unable to do. And that's very important. The argument is because they couldn't, there was a debate. How come you didn't heal them? Well, you, you weren't paying attention, whatever. So Jesus comes and He casts a demon out of a boy and He rebukes the apostles for their lack of faith and prayer. Now, they had the power to do this. I mean, in the past they did it, but perhaps they had forgotten that every miracle and every healing was based on faith in God and they were taking more credit than they needed to. I mean, the argument with the scribes suggests that they may have wanted to impress the scribes rather than to glorify God. Anyway, that's speculation, but that's one speculation anyways. And then after this healing, Jesus mentions again that He will eventually be killed, but this time He adds the idea that He will be betrayed. So you know, every time He repeats something, He adds a new piece of the puzzle, a new piece of information. And of course, they don't ask any more questions of Him because they're not liking the answers that He's giving them and most of them are in denial. So it's bad enough, it's bad enough that He's going to die and resurrect, whatever that means. Now He tells them, and the reason that's going to happen is because one of you is going to betray me. So now you know, they're a little gun shy of asking Him more questions about the subject. All right, number 80. Uh, I guess the only way to explain this is money from a fish. Money from a fish, uh, only Matthew records this, Matthew 17, 24 to 27. Uh, you have to understand Jewish law. Um, each male, 20 years or over, had to pay a temple tax, and not to do so was an act of apostasy, an act of unfaithfulness. So Jesus, in talking to His apostles, 
claims exemption from this because as the son of the father whose house was the temple, he should not have to pay a tax. It's his house. But to not cause stumbling, in other words, he didn't want others to stumble, not everyone understood that idea, he miraculously makes a coin appear in the mouth of a fish, which Peter catches in order, and it says there, to pay the tax for himself, Jesus, and for Peter. Now, an interesting speculation from some scholars is that since Jesus only paid for himself and Peter, the other apostles may have been under 20 years of age at this time. I mean, when you think the, 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 uh, the uh, natural uh, age at that time, the lifespan at that time, the average age was perhaps 52, 50 to 52. That was the lifespan of that era. Today our lifespan may be 70. What is it for, for women? Is, for women is 80 point something and for men it's 78 point something. In those days it was 50, 50 years old, less for women. Many of them died in, in childbirth. And so we know later on that Peter was old when he died in 63 or 64 and John the Apostle was very old. He died in the, you know, at the end of the first century. And so you know, when you see movies about Jesus and the apostles, you always see apostles, men, you know, fully grown men, 35, 40 years old, something like that. But that, you know, it, it doesn't follow the timeline. They were actually very, very young men that were, that were following Jesus. All right, number 81, the question of who is the greatest? Uh, Matthew 18, 1 to 35, Mark 9, 33 to 50, and Luke 9, 46 to 50. So who is the greatest? So uh, again, the money from the fish, the, all the events that are taking place. Uh, and so a dispute arises among the apostles as to who will be the greatest among them in the kingdom. They're still very much under the impression that the kingdom will be some sort of earthly government, some sort of earthly kingdom. And Jesus responds to this with a variety of teaching, lots of different teaching to answer this question in many ways. Uh, the childlike attitude needed to enter and stay in the kingdom, that's one way that he answers it. Uh, the danger of, be, of making a child of God lose their faith or leading one into sin. And then he goes on giving a discourse on how to deal with disputes among uh, brethren. You, know, you, you go alone to the brother, bring another, tell the church, so on and so forth. And then a parable about the necessity of forgiveness. You know, the hard-hearted slave who refuses to forgive. So all of these teachings to try to make them understand that relationships in the kingdom are not based on being great through power and through control or through wealth or things like that or position, but rather by being great based on love and mercy and, and, and service. Mark adds that they also wanted to condemn others who were working in Jesus' name, but not part of their group. And Jesus restrains them, saying that if you're with Jesus, you're with His followers as well. And, and how do we know? We don't know who are all the servants of, of the Lord. We, we don't know that. I mean, we like to identify them. You know, if there's a signed Church of Christ on the door, they must be the followers. But I, I've met people in Quebec, for example, many, many years ago, uh, when I had a television program, uh, there was a group that uh, called me. They, they watched the TV program and uh, they called me and they said, um, uh, we watch your TV program and we're a group of Christians and they were perhaps two, two almost 300 miles north of, of Montreal, which was pretty far north. And uh, they said, would you come and teach us? And I said, okay. And so uh, myself and another brother in the, in the congregation, we got in our car one Friday and we, we, we drove up there uh, in the winter time and it was a man's house. And uh, he greeted us and we spoke with him and it turns out that all of these individuals were people who were from different churches or no church background, nothing, who had discovered reading the Bible for themselves. And they read the Bible and just from reading the Bible they realized that they needed to be baptized in order to become Christians. They needed to be believers in Jesus as the Son of God. They needed to be baptized. And on their own, they had no, you know, they figured out, oh, we're supposed to have communion and it's with bread and it's with wine. And, you know, and, and they had figured out so many things 
They had never heard of the Church of Christ. They didn't know what the Church of Christ was. They had never heard of the restoration movement, you know, let's get back to the Bible, do Bible things in Bible. We never heard of that. They just did it because a lot of them read the Bible and, and they read the New Testament and they read the book of Acts and, the, and they just followed and they decided among themselves they would just follow what the Bible says. A kind of a, a natural, organic restoration movement that just started on the strength of the word and they were maybe, I don't know, 15 people or so. Now, there were a lot of things that, that you know, we, we wouldn't agree with them. They, had, they, they brought a lot of baggage from, from their past, if you wish, and we spent a lot of time discussing those type of things. But uh, they saw themselves as Christians. All of them had been baptized on the strength of simply the, the word. You know, they said, well, the Bible says we need to be baptized, so we were all baptized. And we're taking the communion, not on Friday or Wednesday, but we take it on Sunday. And what they had been doing was they, they needed teaching. None of their teachers were that you know, well versed in the scriptures and they discovered the program that I was doing on TV. And so they, they would, and those, this was before TiVo, before you know, computers. So our show was on at 10 o'clock in the morning on Sunday morning. So they'd all gather there and they'd sing and they, they'd read the Bible and they'd take their communion and then at 10 o'clock they'd turn on the TV and there was the sermon and, and they'd listen to the sermon and amen the TV and, and somebody got the bright idea, hey, why don't we invite that guy to come live? And we went actually a couple of times up north uh, to teach them. Were they our brethren? Of course they were our brethren. You know, they believed in Jesus, they were baptized for the remission of their sins, they took the communion, they, they loved each other, and so on and so forth. So uh, let's remember that, uh, uh, let's not be too quick to, you know, to, to, to realize that we may be the only people that have figured this out. There are a lot of people out there that have access to the Bible and uh, like us, uh, maybe have figured out what Jesus wants them to do. All right, well, with this, Jesus' northern ministry will be coming to a close. He's going to make more trips south until the last week of his life, which he will spend in the city itself, where he will be rejected, of course, condemned and crucified, and we're going to move on with those things. A couple of lessons before uh, we close out uh, this particular session. Lesson number one from what we've discussed. Understanding comes after faith. First, there's faith and then understanding comes. I want you to note that every time the apostles expressed their faith in progressive degrees, you know, following Jesus and then staying with Him when others rejected Him and then actually acknowledging Him as Messiah, every time they took you know, another step of faith, Jesus rewarded them with a clearer vision of who He was. Now they confessed that He was the Messiah you know, he, he bring them up on, on the mountain <laughs> for the transfiguration. You know. Each time they obeyed and walked by faith, he rewarded that faith with a great miracle or a vision or a confirmation that their faith was valid. Well, the point I want to make here is it's the, it works in the same way today. We don't get understanding and then we believe. It works the other way around. You know, I believe, I obey, and then I grow in my understanding and reassurance that what I believed was true. That's called walking by faith. You know, I'm, I'm more sure now of God's forgiveness and promise of the Holy Spirit than I was on the day that I believed. I mean, I believed and I was baptized, but there were so many things I didn't understand, but I took that first step anyways. And every step I've taken, God has rewarded, not necessarily with money or health, or those are all good things, but He's rewarded me with a deeper understanding of His will and His purpose for, for everyone and also for myself. Okay, a second lesson here, and that is um, unity to the head equals unity to the body. Unity to the head equals unity to the body. The apostles didn't want anyone claiming Jesus unless they were part of their group. But Jesus said, if you're united to me, you're united to the body. And it also works in reverse. If you're not united to the body, then you're not united 
to the head. A lot of people say, well, I don't need the church to be, you know, Jesus and I are buddies. I used to know someone who played golf on Sunday and said, you know, Jesus and I are on the golf course together on Sunday morning. I don't need the church. But that's just, it's just not true. It's not biblically accurate. If you're not faithful, if, there, if you're not united to the body of Christ, then you're not united to the, to the head. Jesus died for the church, which is His body, and union with Him automatically means union with the church. You can't separate the two. You can't have it both ways. If you're united to Christ, then you're working out your union with Him through your union with the body. If you're not united and faithfully united to His body, then you're also faithfully united to the Lord Himself. Okay, so those are uh, the events up through number 81. We'll continue our series uh, next time. Thank you for your attention and we'll see you uh, for our next session on the life of Jesus.